Hello and welcome participants from all around the world to the session as part of the IHE Capacity Development Symposium. And we are now flying, we wish, <laughs> to India and to uh, be with Dr. Veena Srinivasan, um, who is the Director of the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation, or ATRI, and in Bengaluru, India. And she is going to share with us lessons about capacity development in the water sector, specifically to one of the uh, big river basins of India. 70%, I think, of the river waters in India are shared between states. And that's an area where uh, there's an, uh, you know, it's, it's work in progress how to do that better. And, and her, her case will be uh, about that. Now, sharing water and the capacity development issues that Dr. Veena will be sharing with us, I'm sure will resonate with you in some way uh, for the uh, issues and challenges that you are facing in your country. So it could also be about a shared river or it could be about other uh, divides that we observe and that we would like to bridge uh, during this symposium and learn how to do that better. So before... Um, we are going to listen to Dr. Vina's keynote presentation. I'm going to ask Anna, uh, our tech host and my colleague to come in and share with us some tips or how you can uh, take the most out of this session. And meanwhile, just before I do that, I'd like to welcome uh, Kaz uh, Cotton and Syed Mohammed Nazimuddin from uh, Bangladesh, from the Asian University of Women, and uh, Indra Rini Tenrisal from Jakarta. Uh, that must be, I guess, Ibu Indra, Indra Rini. And then uh, Kalitasan Kali Asam from Malaysia. So we have from Malaysia. Uh, Jais Desai from Mumbai. Looking forward to the session. Warm welcome, Jayesh, to be with us. And also Thea. Uh, I can't see where Thea is joining from. Please type in the chat where you are joining from and what is your workplace. So we get a bit of idea from each other where we come from and how we fit in this session and what we would like to uh, get out. So Thea from Rotterdam and there's Escher uh, Kale from, um, uh, I used to know that abbreviation, D-W-O-T-R in India. Okay, uh, also in India, warm welcome this uh, case will be about India that we present and then we will also look at the global implications and lessons we can learn from that. So Anna, could you come on and share some tips how we can make the most of this session? Thank you, Vauta, and good morning. I think that the easiest and fastest way to do that and to give the instructions is by sharing my screen. Um, as you can see on the right hand side is and where are some messages coming in. You'll see uh, all the messages and, and the chat option. You can type and uh, interact with each other just below where it says write your message here. And also this gives you the opportunity to ask um, direct questions to the speakers. In order to ask direct questions to, to the speakers, uh, Walter and Dr. Vina, is uh, by the code that is cited just on the top of the chat. And you can view it by scrolling up and down with the sidebar. Um, during this session, we will also have some interactive polls happening as they go along. So I would just ask you to, to answer them as, as they come up just above um, the chat uh, on the right hand side of your screen. Thank you. I'm going to give uh, the floor back to you, Wouter. Thank you so much, Anna. It's a pleasure to work with you and your colleagues at IHE and as we make this session happen together. And uh, I see now that uh, WOTR is the Watershed Organization Trust in India. Welcome. And um, uh, Jayesh is working with uh, uh, ACWAM, uh, an NGO working on the agenda of groundwater. Very important. And in fact, also, we will be visiting that issue. We also have Haider Aziz from Iraq with us. Warm welcome. And then I see two friends all the way from South America, from Ecuador and Colombia. So a warm welcome to Sandra and German. And uh, now maybe that brings us to a good time to uh, 
get introduced first by watching the video, the pre-recorded video of Dr. Vina's keynote. And after that, we'll enter into the live discussion, including the polls that Anna mentioned. And by the way, uh, I didn't pro properly introduce myself, I guess, but you can check my profile. I'm Wouter uh, Linklan Ariens. I'm joining you from Manila in the Philippines. And so we are also global this evening and uh, we love to connect from all places in this now for the first time virtual IHE Capacity Development Symposium. So my pleasure to be with you and I lo look forward to learning together with you and now especially from Dr. Vina. So can we, Anna, can we start the presentation please? My talk today is about bridging the gap between science policy and practice. And I'm going to do this by illustrating the case study of the Kaveri Delta in Peninsular India. The primary argument I make today are that the links between science policy and practice are broken. Mainstream science is disconnected and fragmented. Policy making is dogmatic, not adaptive, and practitioners often lack technical capacity and there's little cross learning. The Kaveri Delta lies at the end of an 80,000 square kilometer Kaveri Basin. The primary, uh, it is the site of a contentious interstate dispute between upstream Karnataka and downstream Tamil Nadu. The Delta itself has been managed by humans for over 2,000 years, when the Kalanai Dam was built. The dam allowed a rich civilization in the Kaveri Delta to develop and flourish. Subsequent rulers, continued to develop water resources by building small earthen dams to store water and irrigate a paddy crop. The conflict, however, began during the colonial period when the upstream princely state of Mysore, present-day Karnataka, sought to build the Krishna Rajasagar Dam on the Kaveri. The downstream area, which was then controlled by the British, the British Madras Presidency, sought to prevent this construction in order to protect the interests of the Delta irrigators. The, the dispute intensified post-independence with both states continuing projects of dam building. It finally resulted in the formation of an interstate tribunal in 1990 and the tribunals deliberated for 17 years and issued their ruling in 2007, applying the principle of equitable apportionment. The long and short of that was that Karnataka was slightly allowed to increase their water use over their 1972 use, and Tamil Nadu's share was slightly decreased over their historical use. Now, the entire context of the Kaveri Delta and the changes that continue to occur even today is therefore rooted in this long history and larger context and cannot be understood outside of it. So therefore, to illustrate the links between science policy and practice, I'd like to use specific examples from data from recent research on the Kaveri Delta. The first argument that science tells us is that flows into the Delta have declined. The data show that the water has been released later and later each year, and the June 28th date for release of water into the Delta canals in order to get a viable monsoon crop from June to September has not been met in recent years. Second, at the same time, the storage capacity of the metro dam, which releases water into the delta canals, has also reduced. This has been illustrated both uh, by siltation studies by the Central Water Commission, as well as studies that we ourselves have done using satellite imagery. However, when we look at the storage volume relationship that is used to understand how much water there is in the, in the reservoir, the storage volume relationship has not changed over time and has not been updated over time. So I'd argue that from the science perspective, that it has been a culture of using data blindly in models without bothering to check their validity. In other words, a lot of the biophysical research is civil engineering and not necessarily inquiry-based science. The third argument is that cropping patterns have shifted in the Delta from, single pad from double paddy to either single paddy or mixed crops due to declining flows. This analysis that we did using Google Earth Engine shows that uh, a, a, a lot of the cropping patterns have changed to mixed cropping in the Delta. However, when we examine the socioeconomic changes, 
we found that in fact, um, a very different story emerged. Based on focus group discussions, interviews with farmers, as well as analysis of the secondary literature, we found that there was very a very different story emerged. Firstly, farmers argued that they were not interested, they were moving away from paddy because there had been no improvement in the support price for paddy despite increasing input costs. Secondly, once farmers had drilled wells to build or, or to depend on groundwater, uh, they had more control over the timing and quantity of water for irrigation, and this allowed them to explore the possibility of higher value cash crops. And finally, there has been a labor shortage in agriculture. Now, very different stories about why there was a labor sh shortage in agriculture emerged. On one hand, farm laborers uh, argued that there had been a mechanization of agriculture. On the other hand, farmers argued that the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, aspirations of youth who were no longer interested in agriculture, as well as alternative opportunities for livelihoods because of the location of industries um, in, your, in the proximity of rural areas, allowed for people to move away from agriculture, and this caused a labor shortage in agriculture. So whether it was a push or a pull factor, the fact is that two very different um, uh, narratives emerged from our research. On one hand, uh, there was a narrative that water shortage was driving uh, cropping pattern changes. On the other hand, there's also a narrative that cropping pattern changes were happening for other reasons and were changing the quantity of water used. So I think this results in a chicken and egg problem, which is does crop avail crop ch cropping changes drive water use and therefore water availability or does water availability drive cropping pattern changes and how to, how to think about this. So from the net of all of these studies, both the biophysical scientific research as well as the social science research, a much more complex picture of the entire deltaic system emerges. And yet, although we see that uh, both endogenous as well as exogenous changes, both biophysical changes as well as socioeconomic changes drive how water use as well as land use in the delta over time, research itself tends to be very siloed and therefore may not, ha may not capture this larger complexity. So while science itself is disconnected and fragmented, policy make the policy making process in turn tends to be very dogmatic. So one example of this is that even today, policy thinking remains surface water focused. I call this surface water thinking in a groundwater world. The data, and this is census data, show that groundwater dependence on the delta has increased over time. And in fact, the particular uh, data shown in this figure may be a slight underestimate because it doesn't capture groundwater use in conjunctive use. Um, the second problem is that policy thinking has remained focused on large infrastructure, neglecting the possibilities of rejuvenating traditional tank systems or, or instituting rules for better groundwater use. Uh, so the map of the Kaveri Delta shows that uh, there is a lot of unirrigated plantations, including Prosopis. The traditional tank system uh, from our field work showed that they were largely sil silted up and overgrown with Prosopis. Now, one reason for this is that the political economy of infrastructure projects in the water sector in India tend to be uh, driven towards large infrastructure for obvious reasons. There is a contractor, a politician contractor nexus, um, and the engineering focused uh, agencies uh, are also motivated um, to, to, to focus on these for obvious reasons. Now, I think it's important to realize that if the, the world itself has changed and uh, releases into the canal network have decreased for completely exogenous reasons. There is, and the obvious question would be, why aren't we rejuvenating the existing sort of structures and, and storing some and harvesting more of the rainwater? After all, the Delta region does get 1200 mm of rainfall a year. And yet we find that due to political economy reasons, this does not emerge as an option. The final point uh, on policy is that policy remains agriculture focused, even as aquaculture is beginning to take over in places, particularly along the coast. This is a Google Earth image um, of uh, the area near Nagapatnam uh, in the Kaveri Delta. And you can see that uh, there is a lot of aquaculture. And, if, and, a, and a view of the historical Google Earth imagery over time will show that the area has expanded. 
our own field research in the area showed that these areas are, are associated with extremely high salinity of both surface as well as groundwater. Um, now, the question remains as to whether it's the aquaculture that's driving the salinity or the salinity that's driving the aquaculture. But regardless, the policy making remains very, very agriculture focused and not really focused on what is happening between the freshwater salt water barrier in these places. Um, finally, I think that there's a, there's a huge gap in the practitioner community and our experience and understanding of NGOs in the, in, in the region as well as throughout India um, reinforces this. Uh, so there are several local uh, civil society efforts to rejuvenate tanks as well as to institute rules uh, for, um, for management of tanks as well as groundwater, leading to the possibility of, of creating new governance structures. It's also important to note that the types of leadership that's emerging in civil society is also very, very different. A lot of young people returning from cities uh, who are more educated, there are more local philanthropists, sometimes non-resident Indians, and there's a lot of corporate social responsibility money as well. Yet, a lot of these efforts tend to be completely fragmented as these groups, local groups, often don't talk to each other. There's very little uh, common consensus in terms of uh, what the problem is in different places, what specifically worked in some places and didn't work, and so on. And each uh, effort tends to reinvent the wheel. So I think overall, there, are, there remain significant gaps between science policy and practice that need to be fixed. Now, I do think that these problems can be solved, but I think it's first important to ask the much bigger question, which is if it was 1970 today, would we have been able to imagine what the Kaveri Delta would look like today and how, uh, and how it would evolve? And if you're unable to do so, then I think we should ask ourselves with what confidence do we build infrastructure projects and, pro and make model projections all the way up to 2100 when we couldn't predict the past, why do we think we would do better at predicting the future? Now, I think there are three questions we might want to ask uh, in order to do better at this. One is to say what changes did occur over the last four decades in the coupled human environment system. Second, Knowing what we know today and understanding what we understand today about the nature of the coupling between the human environment system, can we do a better job of anticipating change in the future? And if so, how do we act both in terms of policy and practice to nudge the system onto a more sustainable and equitable transition pathway? So I'm going to make some very specific recommendations. Firstly, we need to reform the kind of science that's done and the way science is done. Now, when we speak to a lot of research uh, organizations uh, and universities, they argue that they are not incentivized to do the kind of science that's needed to, that's needed to be done. Um, so I think that uh, I'm going to cite IDRC's research, IDRC Canada's Research Quality Plus framework, uh, which I think is extremely useful in creating a framework to judge what kind of science matters so that we can create a scientific establishment that values and incentivizes the right kind of science. First, science needs to be more rigorous. And in my opinion, rigorous science is transdisciplinary science. It cannot be just civil engineering models or just sociological studies. We need science that, uh, and research that's field-based and that will, uh, that will bridge across disciplinary barriers. Secondly, research needs to be relevant. It, any field data that's, connect, uh, that's collected should be based on primary research and should answer questions that actually manage that actually matter to the stakeholders. Third, research needs to be useful. Any knowledge that's generated must be actually usable by the stakeholders in the region. And finally, research needs to be disseminated. It needs to be packaged beyond academic papers to actually be absorbable by those stakeholders. Now, while science needs to change, policy making also needs to change. And I think that there are similarly principles that we might apply to judge uh, and, and, um, and design better policy. First, policy needs to be more relevant. A lot of the pol policy, the question to ask is, is the policy focus relevant to the local context? As I said before, we don't want to be doing surface water policy in a groundwater world. Second, policy needs to be therefore integrative. Uh, they, it needs to include ground and surface water, blue and green water, uh, human and society systems as appropriate. Now, uh, a lot of this, of course, would then depend on the knowledge systems that inform policy 
And as I said, the knowledge system itself is fragmented. Often that's the reason why the policy is, uh, is also fragmented. And so both need to, to go hand in hand. You need integrative knowledge systems and therefore uh, pol integrative policy, which is essential to en ensuring that unintended consequences do not occur. Third, we need ways of being more imaginative in policymaking. Now, I think it's important that this is something that's not going to happen without better design of the policy process itself. Research that looks at historical studies of, or data from the past isn't going to help us design what might work in the future. Now, this idea of design and design thinking is well accepted in the corporate sector as well as other areas of development practice, but often not in the science policy interface. So I think that we deliberately need to design policy processes that ensure that actually actively involve solutioning and then actually um, result in a whole range of design, in a whole range of different policies that we can then test, uh, that we, we can then test and implement. And finally, policymaking needs to be adaptive. Uh, I think one of the main lessons from all of our research in historical human environment uh, systems is that uh, systems change and it's quite difficult to imagine how systems will evolve over time when new technologies ev evolve, when societies and cultures completely change, values change, norms change, everything changes uh, in the, over the course of decades. And so, so assuming that a policy and an and a infrastructure project that we implement today will be relevant in the same way for the next 100 years, uh, is clearly wrong. And therefore, we need explicitly to design policy processes that are adaptive. They take on board new information as well as new changes on the ground um, and update over time. Finally, practice. And I think this is a seriously neglected area. Uh, in And when I speak of practice, I'm speaking about civil society. This is a seriously neglected area in, uh, in the science policy practice trifecta. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, focus, uh, particularly in the international community, has been building government or agency capacity. And I think that this is insufficient. I referred to this uh, earlier in my talk as well, that um, uh, a, a lot of the problems or the focus of policy on large infrastructure is driven by a particular political economy. Now, uh, we we need and and therefore it's not going to change completely on its own without some kind of external pressure. So we need civil society organizations to act as watchdogs, and for that we need to strengthen civil society organizations. So in my experience, one problem is that civil society organizations in India, although they are extremely engaged um, and uh, they are extremely active, they lack technical capacity. So they don't have the ability to actually analyze data or, or find discrepancies when discrepancies are reported. And a lot of the data itself is deliberately um, designed where it is now being forced to be put in the public domain is designed to be uh, to obfuscate. It, it often is that you'll have data sets that use different reference levels. They use different units. Some are monthly, some are daily. Some have only the reservoir level. Some have only the reservoir storage and making it really difficult to therefore piece the entire picture together. And I think this is possible and putting tools in the hands of civil society organizations that allow them to then act as effective watchdogs becomes very, very important. Second, there's a lot of excellent local NGOs, but there's relatively few platforms where they can exchange uh, knowledge and experiences. Often uh, NGOs have to reinvent the wheel, each one figuring out each thing from scratch without being able to learn from others to see what elements of the solution worked and what didn't work. Uh, and as a result of this, you see a lot of cookie cutter solutions, which are all about diesel ting or all about um, uh, digging ditches, but relatively little on what kind of a water user association works, what kind of um, uh, governance system have actually worked in terms of uh, regulating uh, participatory groundwater management and so on. Um, finally, civil society uh, organizations need funding. This is a serious problem. In India, there's been in recent years, one of the biggest sources of money has been corporate social responsibility funds, but corporate social responsibility funds tend to be very project focused and they tend to be very immediate result focused. And as a result, they tend to focus completely on structures again versus uh, building technical capacity, um, uh, figuring out uh, how to institute new governance norms, 
uh, and this sort of thing. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of all three, science, policy, and practice. And the question we need to ask is whose capacity are we building and for what purpose? I will argue that we need to build the capacity of all three, but we need to build the capacity of all three in a concerted fashion so they are able to help each other. Science that is relevant, rigorous, useful, and well communicated. Policy that is relevant, imaginative, integrative, and adaptive. And practice that's well informed, funded, and embedded in a culture of learning so that they are able to take data and actually evolve and adapt over time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fina, for your uh, for sharing your presentation, which we just uh, watched in the recording. A very compelling case of, of issues that are obviously very prominent in India, uh, but also I think in other countries as well. I think the way you describe this uh, triad uh, with the broken links between science, policy and practice is something that we could all uh, to some extent identify with. And, and also, I like very much how you brought this back at the end to the uh, whose capacity are we building for what purpose? We definitely need to do that because, as you explained, uh, in the case of the Calvary Basin, which I think also we can see uh, examples in other countries as well, where lots of changes, both in the physical environment and in water, as well as in the socioeconomic environment, have taken place but science has not, uh, and, 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 and the various uh, the policy and other functions have not been able to catch up and keep up with those changes and, and understand and deal with them uh, properly. So the uh, answer whether we've kept up is a clear no in the case that you have uh, presented. And then you say, well, if we look ahead, we, we couldn't have adapt, uh, anticipated all those changes of the situation we see now let's say uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago so we must really uh, use 21st century skills and design thinking as you called it to do our work now to make uh, sure that what we build capacity for is actually resilient and useful and helps to uh, help society in the various functions that water uh, provides and you talked about anticipatory uh, changes and nudging the various systems for change uh, in a more uh, uh, cohesive and interrelated way. Let me, um, okay, let me welcome Modupe from Nigeria, but joining from the UK, and Diana uh, in Colombia, based in Delft, and also Leon Hermans. So uh, welcome, and uh, others are welcomed earlier. So. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity we have to have discussion with Vina. Dr. Vina, you can ask questions. I already uh, suggest that you start doing that in the chat. Now, all of us are here because of capacity development of responding to the changes that are taking place in our world. And of course, these have accelerated in these last months tremendously in ways that we could not really foresee before that when uh, COVID started hitting. Uh, so we are we're we're looking certainly at change and what we can help to change in the systems like uh, Dr. Vina has uh, has uh, suggested. Now we have a poll and Anna I ask you to uh, invite you to put the poll up the first poll. We just want to get a feeling from you our dear participants how ready are you to be change makers in relation to in the organization where you work? And there are, there are three options for you to choose from. And after a little while, we present the results uh, on screen for us all to see. And I noticed that there are uh, a few of you who are have shared in the chat that you are at the moment between work. So you're in between assignments and you're taking the chance to catch up. So maybe you could answer these questions in relation to your previous uh, work, your previous assignment, if that makes sense uh, to you. So uh, with that, um, Vina, can I uh, 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 ask you to come on screen for all of us live? We are so happy that you can join us today uh, from Bengaluru in India. And I will be uh, kicking off with uh, one question that really builds on what you have asked. Of course, the, the, the holy grail, the, 
know, the question we are after to look at together is how can we do better in capacity development? Where do we start? You have sketched us that macro picture with the three links. Uh, where do we start? And my question would be, which players are not taken seriously at the moment in your case study? And how could we bring them into the discussion, into the table? What sort of capacity uh, would that involve? So can I ask you that question first? Yeah, um, so I think uh, civil society is generally not taken as seriously. So when, when we look at, um, if I had to describe how mainstream agencies kind of think of civil society, uh, they think of them as we kind of do the real serious stuff, right? We build the big dams and we do the canals and all of that. And you guys kind of... Uh, work at the edges, you kind of fix these little, you know, these little, you can diesel a little waterway here, or you can, you can dig up a pond there. And they, they think the little stuff is for civil society and the big stuff is for the serious engineering community. Um, and I think that's problematic because that's basically framing the, the problem saying we know all the big answers and civil society is there to either just, uh, just, just build acceptance of it or, uh, or do the little stuff on the side. And I think this has kind of led to the, the, the dichotomy or, that we have, which is a lot of big dams in India, for example, are seeing de see severe decline in inflows because, uh, because of groundwater overuse, which is being done by billions of individual farmers. And so it's not, so basically that in, even the basic framing of separating out science and society, of separating out infrastructure and society, uh, I think is a problem. So I think unless we restore the equality of all of those three actors, right, of knowledge, and, and, and I would argue that uh, knowledge is also undervalued in, um, in the, in the, I'm going to put infrastructure building and policy in the same, in the same category of policy. But I think that even serious knowledge systems are undervalued in that. A lot of the uh, uh, large infrastructure construction which happens is not based on any serious um, uh, transparent uh, uh, data collection and modeling. And so I think uh, both, at today I would argue that both science as well as practice or civil society are undervalued in the water sector. Um, yeah, and so... I think that giving, restoring both of them to their proper place in being able to actually inform um, uh, policy would uh, is the very first step that needs to be uh, undertaken. Uh, does that answer your question, Martin? I know I went a, a little bit all over the place. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're we're uh, we are uh, taking several perspectives on it, and I think the participants already. Thank you so much for sharing questions and perspectives uh, that will help us to expand that. So um, let's uh, go to uh, Kalitasan Kalyasam. Um, and he says, uh, uh, Vina, what is the best approach to get buy-in from all stakeholders with a win-win model? What is the approach to get buy-in from all key stakeholders with a win-win model? Um... I mean, I think the first step is, I think we talked a lot this morning about trust, for example. And I think that uh, that trust is uh, the very first, and, and, and in the previous, in the panel discussion uh, that, was, that happened earlier this morning, um, Hank talked about uh, safe spaces. And I think those are, uh, the creation of those two is the first step uh, in being able to, to create, to start dialogue between all of the, uh, all of the stakeholders. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's always a win-win model. I mean, sometimes there is. There are win-wins, and sometimes uh, win-wins need to be created by bringing in external resources. By which I mean that, for instance, if you're in a basin which is already a closed basin, that means there's no more water left to be allocated. Um, you do need to then figure out. You move from an age of developing water resources to reallocating or managing water resources more equitably. And that means that you may not always find a win-win in the traditional sense, but you can find a win-win if when you start integrating markets and figuring out how do we get reduced food waste, how do we get 
more efficiency into the system? How do we increase value addition? Because farmers don't, I mean, and I'm speaking primarily of the agricultural sector for the moment, farmers don't want um, to use water for the sake of using water. They want to use water because they want to earn an income. And so focusing on uh, creating those market linkages, getting them better prices, sometimes you might be able to create a win-win when you bring external sectors in, uh, as opposed to just staying within the water sector. I don't know if that made sense. You may not be able to find a win-win within the water sector if you have only a certain amount of water, but you might be able to increase income even as you keep water, uh, even as you place a limit on the total water abstracted by bringing in the agricultural sector, looking at agricultural policy, creating market linkages, investing in value addition, that sort of stuff. So I think that the spaces may not necessarily all lie within the water sector. Right. Yep. And um, uh, thank you for that. I like to uh, uh, hook up with as many participants as we can. So uh, a comment of Diana is uh, from Colombia. I uh, completely agree with how civil society is seen, the same experience. Um, that is a top-down approach and lead to solutions that are not effective on the ground. And then uh, Diana also asked a question then, what mechanisms can be put in place to improve the communication, the communication, that's those nudges, I guess, that uh, Vina was talking about earlier, the communication between science policy and practitioners. Any ideas from lessons from other sectors? So also beyond the water sector, are there examples uh, from your NGO experience, perhaps uh, your research center experience in other sectors that show us uh, the way, Vina? Um, I think there are good examples in both uh, education as well as the, the field of medicine. I know there was an excellent uh, uh, talk earlier this uh, in the week about implementation science and IHE in specific ha uh, specifically has been promoting the concept of implementation science. And I think implementation science is uh, a good example which uh, arose from a different sector, the field of medicine, which basically said, how do we learn from uh, all of the practice that we've actually had, uh, systematize it so that we're actually making that, um, uh, uh, we're evolving a set of design principles from, uh, from, from everything that we've done. And then how do we apply that to, uh, to uh, the practice of medicine? So, uh, so I think that the, the, the fact that in the medical area, they were able to, and there's a number of excellent books on this, that the, but they were able to take very, very, complex and fragmented experiences of millions of doctors all over the world and be able to collapse them into a set of very, very um, succinct set of principles that anybody could learn and practice on their own. Uh, that shows that this kind of, this kind of aggregation and distilling of, of design principles is possible. Uh, and uh, there's been similar excellent examples in the education sector, particularly in India, where people have looked at um, lots and lots of research of what has really worked to improve um, uh, outcomes, educational out attainment in uh, in the K to twelve in, uh, uh, in in K to twelve schooling, and they've found that um, what is done in the first thousand days of a child's uh, life is in terms of nutrition, in terms of uh, uh, a whole range of interventions has very, very long range impacts. And so being able to collapse um, complex information into a set of principles is really what that entire, uh, is what implementation science is. But I think we can, we need to do more and more of that in the water sector. Thank you, um, Vina. And thank you for introducing that in the context of implementation science. And I think looking, to uh, learn from other sectors as well, which is important. And sometimes, uh, in my experience, that isn't enough done in the water sectors. I think a very welcome reminder, prompted, of course, by a great question from Diana. Um, I also see the question from Jayesh, uh, who said, uh, uh, you know, but uh, do we have a plan about who uh, will build uh, whose capacity. So I, I interpret your question as you're ready to get involved and in helping to make those changes happen. And that's a good point to segue to Anna for a moment and to see if the poll uh, results can be shown on screen. Uh, in relation to your attitude, can you be a champion? Can you work on make change happen? Are you keen to do that? So here is the result. 
uh, 27%, I am ready to champion a change or just taking the leadership role as a champion uh, in my workplace. And uh, 60%, 59%, I want to influence a change together with colleagues. So that's very much an indication of that collective leadership that we see more and more in this 21st century and part of 21st century skills. And for such complex issues that we talk about, perhaps that's also a really uh, uh, a good approach. If we are all champions, we might not be as successful as we want. And then 14% says, well, I think it's difficult because my organization resists change, which of course is a reality in many places. So we get a bit of feedback here, how we ourselves uh, self-identify with what role we can play. Um, uh, Anna, that's uh, fine. We could maybe close that and then ask Vina. Vina, do you have some uh, feedback on that, on that uh, poll result? Well, it's very positive. So that's that's uh, excellent, and I think um, it also reflects back one of the one of the themes this morning of uh, uh, comments, and I think it was Ishwar that asked that. Um, uh, how do we create collective leadership? And so I think I think that's point that sh because if you looked at it, 60% of the people said they want to do it, but not alone, working together as a team with their colleagues. And I think therefore uh, this idea of how do we and it, it, maybe this is telling us something about maybe our leadership development when we when we when you put the categories we thought of sector organizations and then individuals. But maybe teams is actually um, a way because it's less lonely and less frightening if you're doing it in clusters of people rather than expecting people to be sole champions all by themselves. And maybe that's telling us that there's a different way we can think about our approach to capacity building. But maybe maybe some kind of buddy system because it's it's quite terrifying if you have to take on such a daunting challenge all by yourself. And maybe maybe that's telling us something. Yeah. Um, actually, Wouter, you're the leadership. Uh, champion, so maybe you can reflect on that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for playing that back to me. I, I uh, in in the twenty first century, our definition of leadership, which has of course changed a lot in these past years too, is very much about a process of influence. So when we talk about in this symposium about changes that we need to respond to to make. Uh, um, uh, to tweak how we do capacity development work. And, and Vina talked about some really major tweaks uh, in the presentation today. And the question is, how can each of us be involved individually and collectively? How can we be more skilled in the different roles we can play as a leader? There's not one way of exercising leadership. I, a champion is one, but uh, working as a team, uh, working as a thought leader, uh, uh, there are several ways, or as an enabling leader, more like a facilitator, especially in complex uh, problems. So I think there's, uh, once we start double clicking on that word of uh, leadership and what that means to each of us, there's a lot to explore and work with. And Vina, you yourself has uh, uh, you have experience uh, with leadership training and, and, and some coaching. Could you perhaps share a little bit personally how that how that helped you? Yeah, so um, the, the, of course, I don't work within the government sector. I, I work for uh, a nonprofit organization. So, uh, but uh, I was and my, my organization very recently uh, and very kindly agreed to let me take leadership coaching. Um, I found uh, leadership coaching to be very, very useful. And I think that it's because I think we forget sometimes. And, and I think particularly in uh, the developing world, there is a little bit of an underemphasis on soft skills, right? In a sense, we, we value hard skills. If you go and ask people in the state agency, would you like to learn uh, remote sensing in GIS or would you like to go for leadership coaching? Uh, they would all say remote sensing in GIS because that's kind of what we emphasize as being valuable. Yet, the minute you come into any kind of leadership position where you have to manage a team of more than, you know, more than two, very quickly you realize that the technical stuff is easy. I can build complex models, which include social scientists and natural scientists. And, you know, I can figure out how they're all going to talk to each other. But if I actually bring them into the room, being able to make them speak to each other respectfully is a non-trivial challenge. And so what you realize very, very quickly is that we can find the intellectual horsepower 
to think about the 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 technical challenges and and by technical i'm using that broadly i mean across social science economics uh natural science whatever but but being able to drive a team of people to agree with each other find consensus and then actually uh manage change that's much harder and and i think that we also sometimes have a tendency to think that leaders are somehow born that somebody is born they they were born a great leader and i think that the the evidence clearly shows that this is a learnable skill leadership is a learnable skill which means that you can be given a set of very very specific tools um uh, in uh, to understand how you should you how you should cope with all with different situations so for instance um i when i worked with the coach uh one of the things she you know each session we would work through one particular thing i was struggling with whether in my personal growth as a a professional or in managing a team and uh, and she would work me with through very very specific ways of managing them uh it would could be a script of here's how you can speak it could be a realization of just being able to work through what's within your control and what's not in your control how can you enhance what you have and and diminish what's actually the barriers that are stopping you all of this stuff and i think teaching people this stuff helps and sometimes uh just saying that these things are important and as important as technical skills is the very first step right right thank you and i think you've uh, answered <clears throat> diana's question uh, she thanks you for naming the elephant uh, and how to persuade under such uh, uh difficult conditions of vested interest environment uh, what's your experience i think you shared that a bit and uh, as a moderator i could very quickly share also that this uh, this challenge of how to influence how to bring people together out of silos to get them to work together to trust each other to make significant changes happen is something that i as a as a water specialist my whole career in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work from very early on i found that my colleagues in the asian development bank and other places where i worked didn't have the benefit of training as an influencer uh, you know more into the psychology the interpersonal skills the emotional intelligence was mentioned this morning so i decided to shift my career and went back to learning more about those fields and i'm now helping people full time in this area which is very exciting one of the flagship programs i'm involved with is actually where water professionals go through a 9 months program while they're on the job but in that 9 months they learn the different ways of uh, practicing leadership as well as getting coaching like vina has been describing so so for sure it's possible uh, to do that and uh, leadership research about influencing is a very exciting field to that i warmly recommend all of you to take a look at and if there's anything i can help to introduce that to you or to connect you to resources then uh, 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 please do uh, contact me i'm happy to do that and in fact uh, since 2014 we have been introducing that in ihc uh, in one of the summer courses on becoming a water leader which is a five day five day program very experiential learning all right so the uh, let's see um Kanita San says uh, as you mentioned about the soft skill how about traditional knowledge have you managed to tap into these resources of traditional knowledge vina can you clarify yeah um, and i'm also going to while i respond to that i'm also going to respond to something that jayesh put uh, mentioned earlier which is uh, whose capacity is build, being built and for what purpose um yep. and i think that this is uh, those two are kind of relevant because in a sense if you say or uh, is the only form of knowledge um scientific knowledge that we understand and and are taught in engineering schools and there's no other form of knowledge relevant and what about the lived experiences of farmers they sometimes understand their aquifers better their streams better and they 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 might not know how to frame it in a scientific way but that doesn't mean they understand the system so i do think that traditional knowledge uh, matters a lot i uh, would not like to say that we should use traditional knowledge necessarily blindly because we have to understand that even our traditional knowledge system sometimes came with uh, embedded power in inequities for example so some of our traditional knowledge came with 
you know, built in maybe caste inequities in the case of India. So we do need to, we, we want to incorporate it. We want to acknowledge that all forms of knowledge uh, are and knowing are valid, but we also want to be careful about how and when we de deploy that. Now, in the context of what Jayesh said earlier, whose skill is being built and for what, I think it's, I want to acknowledge the work that Aquadam itself does, that's the organization that he belongs to, in being able to train barefoot hydrogeologists, where these are um, uh, these these are really, really grassroots people that they're training how to map aquifers and be able to manage their own aquifers better. Really, really excellent work. I think that's a really good blend of the uh, what you would call the old and the new, right? Because you're training people that are already traditionals in those professions. Uh, they, they already have traditional knowledge in those in those domains, but you're kind of augmenting it with more modern understanding to be able to create a more full picture. So you're not throwing out all of their deep, rich understanding of the field, but you're not also just taking it as is on uh, on good faith. Um, yeah, I think I'll... Right. And um, Anna is asking a question. Uh, in order to link up to the fields uh, of science, policy, and practice, uh, do we need to change the uh, university's curriculum? How would you link up all those fields without altering the knowledge that's now understood as required for a profession? So we look more at the uh, you know, professional side and the education. Correct. So I, I think that when it's important to say that when we talk about interdisciplinary knowledge, we're not saying that everybody should become a jack of all trades. Uh, I don't think that is what the the claim is. I think that if you if you can still have specialization, if you give people uh, the understanding that other disciplines and knowledge uh, systems exist and they have value, and if you're able to teach them that meta concept that other uh, knowledge systems have value, other disciplines have value, and they and here's a language with which you can ask them questions and uh, and engage with them. So you're not necessarily making everybody study economics and sociology and, and, and every possible subject you need. You might just be studying three or four things. But if you're taught in a very, very explicit way to respect all knowledge systems and to be able to figure out. Uh, so for one of the things we teach, we, we run an interdisciplinary PhD program at my institution. One of the things we teach is philosophy of science, for example. So we say that even though this is your knowledge system, this is kind of the framing of the epistemology and ontology and the way it looks at the world. And these other disciplines look at the world in different ways and they can help you in these ways. So without having to actually force everybody to do the five courses of economics and sociology and everything else, which is really impossible. But I think respect, we can still teach. Just, I hope that helps. In right. Yeah. All right. Uh, meanwhile, you have seen that we put up a second poll and the second poll is now that we have been going into this discussion and we are thinking about what changes to make, who makes those, where is the capacity come from, how we bring people together. We've touched on a lot of perspectives. The poll is about which do you think, which level of intervention or focus is the most important? And Anna, uh, do you think we are ready to show the results of that poll? There we go. So the question is, where should the main change in capacity development happen as a result of our discussion right here? Is it more at the country and sector policy level that we see uh, a majority there, 60%? And we see still moving lines in organization. So perhaps that reflects something about the experience of organizations. But earlier we said that you know we are, we are able, uh, especially when we work together to make change happen in organizations too. But also encouragingly about a third uh, looks at the individual implication, what each of us can do and how we can help other individuals to work with change uh, uh, in a more personal and individualized manner. Yeah, wonderful to see that. So that's a, a, a nice way of feedback sharing. Uh, thank you, Anna, for putting that up. I think we can... Um, we can uh, take that off again. And I have asked you a question because the way I would like to wrap up, we have five minutes uh, uh, before we wrap up this very valuable and interesting session, is to ask you what has been your main takeaway from this session where we discussed tough uh, challenges on the ground 
with, uh, we could say, systems, the three systems that Vina mentioned that were broken in the case of the Calvary. And then she gave very specific and insightful uh, recommendations of how to fix that and implications for capacity development. And her message is that as we look towards the future, there's no way we can predict it 30, 40, 50 years ahead. So we must come with a new system, new processes uh, to design those processes of change and capacity development. And it cannot be done in isolation. One thing, Vina, maybe before uh, we take a quick round of the takeaways, uh, what is the what is the uh, role of different generations here? And you know, in my career, I've been so in so many water meetings where the average age of the participants in the room was well, I don't really want to say, but you get the point. <laughs> so, uh, Vina, how how is that an important driver itself to get the more 21st century model of change introduced, uh, whereas some of the policies, laws, and procedures often are the legacy of the past generation, right? Would you, would right. you say correct? Um, yeah, I think that we, we discussed it in the panel discussion this morning as well. Uh, and firstly, I have to say that Antonella, who uh, I wish we'd heard more of, and who runs um, the Youth Solutions Network, yeah, I Water think. Solutions. Yeah, water water solutions. solutions. Uh, really, really brought this point of what the youth can contribute to the sector and specifically um, entrepreneurship. And I'm going to use entrepreneurship very broadly, but technology is one component of entrepreneurship. Now, I really think that actually, and until I to be honest, I will tell you, until we had the panel discussion with Antonella a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't thought about the role of youth in the sector. So I'm very grateful for her to kind of stated that explicitly, because it did make me realize that the sector is uh, uh, is, is, is basically losing by not being able to harness the power and the energy and the skill sets of the youth uh, of the youth today. So I'll give you one really quick example. When uh, a couple of, uh, a few months ago, we were approached by somebody to say, you know, can you help us think about this big idea in the water sector in India and so on. And we started doing some research uh, on what it is that NGOs on the ground needed in order for them to be able to act more effectively. And a lot of the NGOs were describing uh, doing um, some of the work that they were doing by paper and pen, like they would be doing 50, 60 years ago. When in fact today, the kinds of tools that exist in the public domain with Google Earth, with Open Data Kit, with just a whole bunch of things, they've completely transformed the way that things can be done. And But because we continue to have, similarly, when we run our uh, our training, uh, uh, when we run our training for state agencies, the sessions that generate the most excitement are the sessions which show people how to use GIS and remote sensing and open data kit and, and Google Earth and so on. Because suddenly, uh, the young engineers who did not have any felt they were completely disempowered. They had no tools in their hand to be able to overcome this big machine, right? And what water, water agencies are very hierarchical and top down. But suddenly, technology put a tool into their hand, which suddenly made them empowered. So I think that firstly, creating a space, bringing young people in, and then giving technology into their into a set of technology tools into their hand can actually be a way to completely transform transform the sector because it gives these people the ability to make data transparent, to report from the ground to collect data in ways that they were un unempowered to collect right. data and so on. So I think yeah. it can be very, very transformative if we bring youth, to, uh, youth into the sector, but do so in a very, very explicit way. Right, right. And uh, I, and again, I, I often refer to them as emerging leaders. Um, and we don't just need them for to be future leaders, as uh, some uh, people keep repeating. We need to make changes now, and we can do that in teams. I uh, am unable to reflect all of your takeaways, but be sure that we carefully capture them. However, I do want to, and, and thank you. Nice to see Bronwyn and uh, uh, Pete Filet from Brisbane. Um, I want to uh, give a quick, fee uh, quick feedback on Sydney Burns, who has shared that something I'm thinking about as a result 
of the earlier poll result is to show us that many people are viewing themselves as part of a team of colleagues to influence change in their workplace. How can we embrace this mindset at the sector uh, level and reduce the competition between institutions to become uh, individual sector champions and instead foster collaboration and uh, collaboration towards a common goal? What is fundamentally driving this competition and how can we support drivers for collaboration? I think this is, a, for me, resonates strongly with me. I believe that's, uh, that's possible, that uh, I also uh, resonates with me that this is one of the takeaways to, from this kind of discussion that we have right now. And as we uh, want to take that forward. Um, now, I am going to uh, ask Anna, Anna, could you please come in for a moment and share how uh, we can take this discussion forward, the many valuable comments that are, have been made in the chat? Yes, sure. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to quickly share my screen uh, to share some slides that have already been attached to this webinar itself, and you will be able to find it just above the, fat, the chat uh, function. Um, for those questions that have not been answered, they'll be taken on to the post that will contain the recording of this webinar itself. Since most participants or some participants um, of the conference CAPDEF uh, SIMP were not able to attend due to time zone constraints. And the, by doing so, we open the discussion further uh, uh, than this live webinar. I also want to encourage to make use of social media and the hashtag of the um, symposium itself, and also to invite you to contribute to the DEFT agenda by following the URL that you will find uh, down below. Thank you. And I'm going to give back the floor to you, Wouter. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have we are just a, a few minutes over our uh, time to wrap up. And I want to wrap up quickly by thanking all of you, dear participants, for joining so actively by your very informed comments and questions and really carrying this discussion forward just in that rich manner that we were all looking forward to. Uh, I'd like to thank the team here at IHE Delft who is making all of this possible. This is the first time that this symposium is transferred online. That's a big step into the future. Uh, right now, and we acknowledge them for doing that. And I'd like to warmly thank uh, Dr. Veena Srinivasan about uh, telling her impassioned story. We could see the passion and we could see the, you know, the care also about what happens between these sectors and how we can find ways to nudge these systems, as she called it, to develop capacity uh, much more smartly into the future, more collaboratively. Thank you for all of you for contributing your insights and sharing uh, your feedback on the polls. And the uh, majority of you, 60%, was uh, of the view that we can make change happen together by working as teams or in other forms of collaboration. And that could go a very long way uh, to address some of the shortcomings of the past solutions, which don't really work anymore well today and definitely not, uh, not tomorrow. And uh, emerging leaders, young leaders, young professionals uh, are definitely a part of that. But the 21st century is for all of us. So I think for those of us who are uh, not quite that young, uh, it's our challenge to unlearn. And from my coaching and leadership practice, I know as I work with executives and more senior professionals and managers, unlearning is not a very easy thing to do, but it can be done too, just like leadership can also be taught as, as uh, Vina has uh, shared with us her experience. So Vina, the last word for you with a short tip on how to take it forward, and then we are closing. Well, I have to say that I was more, uh, I learned more than I don't know, than I, I think I imparted in this, very, very interesting. But I would just like to make a quick comment about the online forum. I don't know if we would have got people from so many different places in the world if it had been an in-house um, uh, symposium. And so it's really been uh, a very fascinating discussion. I hope that uh, what I took away from what all of you said and from your questions uh, on the role of bringing uh, of the difficulty of CSOs, traditional knowledge, 
in being what are the ways in which we can uh, actually bring uh, science and society together what does it exactly take to bring that kind of dialogue together all of those are food for thought uh, and thank you for attending and listening thank you so once again thank you and we'll uh, take this discussion forward please keep joining the symposium as we work towards the delft agenda but then importantly to implement that and stay in touch with each other as bina said we are now opening that possibility of working together the kind of collaboration that we have talked about in this session thank you again and uh, it's time to close thank you very much